Well, hello there, all you magnificent people. My name is Will. This is an ecologist plays a channel where we get to talk about nature while playing games. And we are back in Terra Null, the game where you are rehabilitating degraded areas around the world. Now, last time we had just gotten to the point where the rain started coming down, which is absolutely marvelous. And we are now finally going to move on and start establishing a few more habitats than just meadows and lagoons. So last time we did end up making some lagoons here as well and when editing the video I did come to the realization that lagoon and we often use that term especially in South Africa we use that term incorrectly. A lagoon is a piece of water usually salty that is cut off from the ocean by a sandbank or a coral reef or some kind of barrier and so our lagoons over here have actually been cut off from the ocean which is right over here and you know it's therefore a lagoon i just wanted to point that out as well i learned that while editing the video last time so in south africa we kind of call a whole bunch of estuaries which are where rivers flow into the ocean we call those lagoons very often which is incorrect and i'm sure around the world people also will do that now the rains are coming down and we are having all these polluted areas becoming unpolluted which is great for us and we are now going to start bringing in different biomes we've got the sunflowers but that's pretty much it the sunflowers and the meadows now we'll start by bringing in some bamboo forests and look at that oh that's just marvelous so we're taking the old skyscraper skeletons here and turning it into a nucleus for a new forest ecosystem a nice bamboo forest ecosystem so let's actually bring in another one over here that's going to be great as well and i think we'll probably just bring in the one last one right on this side and we have enough of the bamboo forests now bamboo are really really amazing these are basically big grasses they are in the same family as typical grasses they are poaceae and they grow massive they are the largest grasses in the world characterized as all grasses are by those little uh, rings that you can see all around the grass stem those are what we call the nodes and then there's the internode in between and as with most grasses they are uh, hollow inside they also grow extremely fast uh, they are the fastest growing grasses in the world i believe and can grow quite tall as well now this whole bamboo forest over here and you know the bamboo in the uh, bamboo nursery over here could actually be one plant and then this one right at the top here could also this whole forest could be one plant and with that there is the potential problem for species that are adapted to bamboo forests because bamboo are what we call monocarpic they will only flower and fruit once in their life and when they have done they will die and because this is one individual uh, even though the roots may be separated and you know this little clump could be separated from its neighbors it's still genetically one individual so when this original one starts flowering all the clones of it because they are the same plant and genetically they are programmed to start flowering at a certain age the whole forest will actually start flowering and then after that the whole forest will die which is a problem for animals that are specifically adapted for life in this bamboo forest like an animal we will see in a little bit uh, so they then basically lose the entire habitat no, no, that's a problem so we'll get back to that in a moment now the other biome we are going to establish is this the deciduous forests and we are creating that on our little uh, toxin scrubbers in the area and there we go we have deciduous forests deciduous forests basically being forests that drop their leaves during the less nice or less pleasant season so usually during winter they will be dropping their leaves and we're going to put some deciduous forest in there we're going to put some in here and I think we now have enough there we go so we have got all the biomes we need and oh look at this we've got our meadows yes but we're going to start establishing deciduous forests over here as well because i like deciduous forests and then we have our bamboo forests all along here and i think let's actually put in one more bamboo forest right over here because i like it i like seeing these bamboo forests all over the place but we are now also going to obviously bring in is the animal observatory we're going, just going to plop that down right over there. So we can now also start looking for animals. 
and we'll do that in a moment. Now deciduous forests like these are actually more of a common occurrence in the northern hemisphere. Very few areas in the southern hemisphere actually have deciduous forests. Like South Africa for example, we don't have. Well, we've got a few smallish types of forests that are deciduous in nature. Sand forests for example along our east coast, which is growing in sand. In winter it gets extremely dry for them and they do drop their leaves. But most of our forests are actually evergreen, so they keep their leaves throughout the year. They will be continuously dropping their leaves, but there's no season like fall or autumn, like we have over here, that the, most individuals will actually drop their leaves. The trees in deciduous forests, however, will drop their leaves. Now, these forests would consist of trees like oak, and I think this is probably an oak tree over there, or maybe a liquid amber. There will be aspen in there, there will be things like uh, poplar trees as well. I think a lot of these yellowish trees will be poplars or aspens, I think. And in some cases, like in North America, for example, you'll have uh, trees like the quaking aspen, which will form large forest patches. But similar to the bamboo forest here, the whole forest could actually just be one individual that has spread over a larger area by having underground roots that extend laterally or horizontally and then popping up new individuals there where the roots go. So one tree would start over here and spread out all the way around and you'll have little babies, clones of it, popping up all over the show. And because it does that, because it genetically it's one individual, that one individual is coded genetically to drop its leaves at a certain time of the year, a certain point in the year. And because the whole forest could actually consist of one individual, just clones of it, the whole forest could actually drop leaves at exactly the same time, which I just find amazing. Like one night you're there, it's green, the next day the leaves and all the trees just start turning yellow and snow, uh, and there's no sporadic changing or systematic changing like we have here with some trees still green, some yellow, some orange, some red, all of them just kind of overnight start shutting down. And this is of course an adaptation to survival in very cold areas, especially areas with snow in winter. Now before we actually scan for animals, we are looking, just looking at these optional goals over here. We have actually accomplished all of them. Uh, the previous ones here, the moss on rock faces for example, moss on boulders and kelp forests, we had them, but now that it's too hot, they are no longer forming. So if you look here for example, we still have our kelp forests, but they are they haven't established, they're not establishing on their own anymore. They just popped up in certain areas. So, let's now look for animals. And the first animal we are going to look for would be this little guy, which is a gentle giant happily gnawing on bamboo near a glade. Now, this means we'll be looking for an animal mostly in bamboo forest, but perhaps close to the open area. And there we go, we have the giant panda the mostly vegetarian bear in the world and feeding almost exclusively on bamboo. There we go, all the old family happily meandering about. There's most likely the mother with her two cubs of this season as well. Now giant pandas like these really do face a problem with the fact that they are almost exclusively found in bamboo forests. And as I've mentioned earlier, one bamboo forest like this could actually be one individual grass. And when that grass has finished flowering, it will die. So this whole forest may disappear in a very short span of time. And if this forest dies, then the family of giant pandas over here will not have enough food and they will starve to death. Now, naturally, what would happen is they would go out of this and move to other forests, other bamboo forests. And then if this forest over here starts dying back, they would move over to another bamboo forest. They would really be all over the show. And I see just by me looking for them over here, we also actually have found them over here, which is quite interesting. I didn't know that they would pop up in all these areas that are suitable. That's something new for me. But anyway, they would be moving between these bamboo forests. And that's how the system works or should work. Now, however, we as humans have gone and between these forest patches, we've got rice paddies and cities and all kinds of agricultural developments happening between them. And there's no way the giant pandas can now move from one forest patch to another when that forest patch starts dying back. And that is why giant pandas are battling in the world. They don't have those corridors, those ecological corridors they need to move between one area and another. 
Now, in South Africa nowadays, with the environmental impact assessments that we are doing, uh, one part of the animal compliance statements, so basically looking at the threatened species that are potentially in an area of development, we have to, for example, look at, okay, which species are there and which rarer species are possibly there. But very importantly, we also have to look for areas where we could have ecological corridors between habitats for those threatened species. So if we, for example, had a development and we were in the area where there were giant pandas, let's say, for example. And of course, if we were to try and put up a development over here now, as environmental practitioners, we would go and say, OK, this area you can't develop here because it's going to most likely be a corridor for things like giant, pa giant pandas to move between this bamboo forest and this bamboo forest. And I think that is great to have the legislation and the ability to then identify the possible corridors for species as well. Now, in some habitats, like the bamboo forest, they would typically be fragmented like this as well. And in South Africa, our forests also are generally fragmented. That's just the way they are. However, in other areas, things like these deciduous forests would actually occur in usually very, very large, extensive areas. Unfortunately, we as humans have caused them to become fragmented. In North America, for example, large pieces of deciduous forests were actually harvested and burnt to use as potash or basically to export as potash and that was exported back to Europe to use as fertilizer in Europe and as a result about three quarters of the deciduous forests in North America were removed which is really really horrendous and now uh, things certain trees for example really are battling because they have lost the large expanses that they previously were in and of course things like the passenger pigeon have actually gone extinct because they've lost deciduous forests they needed large intact pieces of deciduous forests and they needed large population numbers to actually breed and when the when the habitats were destroyed less breeding sites but then they also were shot out and then they didn't reach that critical number or that critical mass for them to start breeding and as a result they went extinct really really Quite a sad part of the natural history there. Now we are just going to look for one more species and I think that is going to be this little guy. This resplendent fowl that struts on wide open grasslands. So we are going to just look for it right over here and voila we have peacocks over here. Now this will probably be the Indian peafowl which is one of three species of peafowl. One of two in the Pavo genus, the other one being the one from Indonesia, known as the green peafowl, which also occurs in Myanmar and Thailand and other Southeast Asian countries. Now in Africa we also have, oh that's beautiful, it's just doing its thing over there, we'll get back to that in a moment. Oh, gorgeous. Now in Africa we also have one species of peafowl known as the Congo peafowl, and most people don't know about that one, which is in the Afro Pavo genus, so Afro referring to African. And then just Afro Pavo, it's the peacock from Africa. But of course, these are all three males because peafowl are clearly sexually dimorphic, meaning males and females look completely different. Males, of course, having this resplendent color scheme and females being much duller in color. The male's brilliant colors here are, of course, to attract a female, whereas the female is duller in color so that she is camouflaged when sitting on eggs, brooding the eggs and, you know, taking care of the chicks. Chicks also will be relatively dull in color. Females and chicks eventually will of course have lightish green on their necks, but that's about it. But for all its amazing color, and there we go, just the male spreading out its uh, tail feathers to of course attract a female. Really, really an amazing sight to see. And I'm sure most of us have seen this. Oh, that's just gorgeous. Now for all its amazing color, the feathers of a peacock is actually just brown in color. None of this amazing coloration that we are seeing here is due to actual pigments in the feather. The feathers are all just brown. But the color we see here is an example of structural color. The color here is because the feathers are refracting light. It's structured in such a way that it refracts light and breaks it up into different wavelengths. And as a result, we can see the different colors on there. And that's kind of why it also kind of shimmers when you're looking at it from different angles. That's because the light is being broken up or refracted slightly differently. Most birds around the world, the color we see is structural color. It's because the feather is refracting light in such a way 
that we can see blue and green and all those magnificent colors. Now, of course, the whole idea of having such a long tail and being brilliantly colored is so that you do stand out, you are attracting a female. It's also kind of a handicap. It makes it easier for tigers and so to go and catch the peafowl. And it makes sense that if you are brilliantly colored like this and you are impressive in size, you have a great chance of attracting a female because she looks at you and she goes, well, you're still alive, aren't you? You must have amazing genetics and are able to survive despite this handicap. So, you know, I think you will be the father of my children. And therefore it does work as a way to attract females. And we are just going to keep on scanning for some peafowls. Nothing there, but we have got them over here as well. We're just going to scan all around here. We are going to have hordes and hordes and hordes of peafowl right over here. Okay, well, relatively hordes. We've got two males. <laughs> Three males. Okay. I think that is actually a good point to also call it a day for today. Next time we are going to look at these four different creatures we still have. And of course we are going to break it all up and move on and finish this last map. And uh, that is going to be marvelous. So thank you once again everyone for tuning in to this little adventure of ours in Terra Null. So join us next time and hope you have a marvelous week further. Stay safe everybody. I'll see you all soon. Bye.